I have the great honor of getting to lead this conversation with Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, uh, Curtis is the best-selling author of seven novels, Prep, The Man of My Dreams, American Wife, Sisterland, Eligible, Rodham, and Now Romantic Comedy, which was picked for Reese Witherspoon's book club. Her first story collection, You Think It, I'll Say It, was published in 2018 and also picked for Reese Witherspoon's book club. Um, I'm curious to know, just by a show of hands, how many of you have already read Romantic Comedy? Awesome. Can you see past the first row? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I did see hands back there, I think in the third row. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to assume everyone else had their hands up. Um, and so I'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Romantic Comedy follows Sally Metz, a sketch comedy writer for a Saturday Night Live type show called The Night Owls, who thinks she's sworn off love until Noah Brewster, a famous hot pop star, um, is a guest star on the show and flips the script on all of Sally's assumptions, uh, which I will tell you. Uh, that she is pretty sure would disrupt the space-time continuum for a world-famous singer who looks like you to get involved with a TV writer who looks like me. Um, and it is just one of the funnest books that I've read this year. Um, so I am really excited for you all to read it who haven't yet. Uh, and to just give you a sense of, like, of the tone and the voice, um, I would love it if you would read a little bit. Um, thank you. Um, th thank you also, um, all of you, for being here. I, this is my first time at the Texas Book Festival. I always wanted to come, and um, <laughs> this year I got to. Um, and uh, also, several people, um, when I learned I had been paired with Maya for this conversation, several people told me how lucky I was. And if you're wondering, we psychically coordinated our outfits. <laughs> But, but not, and even even better, um, if some of you, I'm sure, have attended other events, that um, we were in the sort of author green room, and um, uh, Jonathan Lethem was wearing a denim jacket, and so Jeff Dyer said, Curtis, you put on Jonathan's jacket, and then so we took all these pictures, like as if we're like yeah. playing dress, so, like if you're wondering what the writers are doing when we're not on stage. We really did not plan this. We're, we're apparently easily entertained, but anyway, thank you all so much for being here. Um, so this is, this is from the very beginning of the book, the prologue, so I don't think it needs um, any sort of context. Um, okay. You should not, I've read many times, reach for your phone first thing in the morning. The news, social media, and emails all disrupt the natural stages of waking and create stress, which is how I'll preface the fact that when I reached for my phone first thing one morning and learned that Danny Horst and Annabelle Lilly were dating, I was furious. I wasn't furious because I was in love with Danny Horst, or for that matter, with Annabelle Lilly. Nor was I furious because two more people in the world had found romantic bliss while I remained mostly single. And I wasn't furious that I hadn't heard the news directly from Danny, even though we shared an office. The reason I was furious was that Annabelle Lilly was a gorgeous, talented, world-famous movie star, and Danny was a schlub. He wasn't a bad guy, and he too was talented, but for Christ's sake, he was a TV writer, a comedy writer. He was a male version of me. He was pasty-skinned and sleep-deprived and sarcastic. And perhaps because he was male, or perhaps because he was a decade younger than I was, he was a lot less self-consciously people-pleasing and a lot more recklessly crass. And then I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, and it, um, okay, um, I might have been able to forgive them both, except that theirs was the third such pairing that had occurred at TNO, which is the SNL stand-in, in the last few years. And as anyone who's ever written a joke or heard a fairy tale or read an article in the style section of a newspaper, there's a rule of three. In this case, it constituted the trend of a romance between a bona fide celebrity and a TNO staffer who'd met on the show but crucially, a bona fide female celebrity and a male staffer. 
The year before, at a wedding I'd attended, an icy blonde Oscar-winning British actress named Imogen Wagner had married a cast member named Josh Beekman, best known for his recurring character, Backney Guy. And the year before that, the head writer, Elliot Markovitz, five foot eight, 40, and my top cider wearing boss, had married a multi-platinum album selling pop singer named Nicola Dornan, five foot 10, 30, and a special envoy for the UN. And this, of course, was the essence of my fury, that such couples would never exist with the genders switched, that a gorgeous male celebrity would never fall in love with an ordinary, dorky, unkempt woman, never, no matter how clever she was. But I also knew, as I lay in bed, glaring at the screen of my phone, Danny and Annabelle's debut as a couple had occurred the night before in the form of making out at the club where Annabelle's 24th birthday had been held, that I would write about my fury. Just as I always did, I'd turn my feelings into comedy, and that was how I'd cure myself. Um. Thank you. Uh, uh, by the way, I feel compelled to say I brought a copy of Romantic Comedy to Texas, left it in my suitcase, left my suitcase at the like check-in at, the, at my hotel. So it's like, I don't know if that means I'm an organized or disorganized or some, some combination of, but that's why I'm borrowing Maya's, which, and I also have to say, I really respect the, all the post-its inside Maya's copy of my book. So all of your novels um, very strongly embrace pop cultural phenomena. And I'm curious to know where the idea for romantic comedy came from. How did I come up with this idea of, you know, um, men on a comedy show, maybe d dating, dating up? Well, so... Pure fiction. I know. And um, <laughs> so I have children who are now 12 and 14. And in December 2019, I was looking for a particular SNL sketch, which I actually never found, but... I introduced them to SNL. Um, and I think in part because they were a little young, there's something extra magical about SNL when it's sort of like you sometimes don't get the joke, but you know it's funny and it makes adulthood seem intriguing and it's a little inappropriate, sometimes very inappropriate. <laughs> anyway, so my family started watching a lot of SNL during the pandemic. Like Sally, I noticed this pattern. And I would think to myself, um, someone should write a screenplay for a romantic comedy about a writer on a show like this, a female writer, who writes a sketch making fun of the pattern and then and saying how it would never happen you know, for the, the female writer and the male celebrity. And then that week she has chemistry with the male celebrity host slash musical guest. And then several months passed and you know the pandemic dragged on and on and I was sort of you know going going stir crazy and um, you know it's obviously it was like a very challenging time I think for for everybody and and I thought like I want to write something more fun I actually had started a different novel that I think is sort of intriguing but was not fun um, and so then I thought to myself oh that idea I had before maybe that um, screenplay should be a novel, and maybe that someone who writes it should be me. I love it. Um, and I'm going to get to some more fun questions, but I, what really struck me about this novel is that it's as much a love story between a woman and a man as it is between a woman and her writing, uh, about craft, improving it, structure, uh, being identified by it, and who you write for. Um, and I... I just, I'd love for you to talk about that. Also, I mean, I'm sure some people in the audience know, but you are a TV writer, right? So, so everything she says has so much more credibility than... than um, uh, I mean, yeah, it's definitely... I, I think that in some ways the book is about um, a person who's professionally confident and sort of... She's not even personally insecure as much as specifically romantically insecure. And I do think... Not only can that like inconsistency or tension exist within any of us, but I think it usually does. And so there's like, I think that all of us are kind of a mix of like, you know, poised and like very not poised or confident and insecure. Like a person could be, you know, like a, a high power lawyer who like cries at the dentist or like a lot of writers who you know and respect like 
can't drive or like won't drive on the highway or be, I mean, um, and someday I might be one of those, right? <laughs> no, but, but anyway, so I think that um, I did want to explore, like, I mean, we all sort of contain multitudes, right? And, but I, I, I like the idea of writing about a person who's professionally competent, just because I know so many people who are professionally competent, and it usually makes them more interesting to me. And yeah, it's just like, and sort of often like more grown up. And I did want to write about grown ups. Yeah, well, and I, I love also that you have a female protagonist who's not awkward, who's not clumsy. Um, it's just that the celebrity glossy glam world is not her world. Um, her job is writing it. Yeah, um, yeah, and that she makes a very clear distinction, which, again, I do think that that's a real thing that people do. Like, she's sort of, again, she's often around celebrities, but she she is very clear on... Um, her role or what the hierarchy is, which I, I also think it's an interesting thing to think about what spoken or unspoken like rules or patterns all of us really believe in and how that kind of guides our behavior and guides us getting through the day. And then to also to step back as Sally ends up doing and think like, I can be right that that's a pattern that that exists. Like usually you know, comedy men date up and comedy women don't, or women don't, like, which I do, I happen to think this is anecdotally true, that probably in all of our social circles, I think not, I mean, of course, I cannot sweepingly 100% say this, but there are more people where you're, like, if you think of heterosexual couples, where you might be scratching your head on how that guy, like, <laughs> you know, got that woman instead of how that woman got that guy. Um, so, so she, but she can, she can be right in observing a pattern and wrong that it's 100% true or that it applies to her, every situation, including the one she's in. Um, so on the note of being a TV writer, it really reads as if you were embedded in this writing staff for several years. Uh, and I would love if you would talk about the research because there's, there's so many specific things like that even more complimentary when you're pitching a sketch is, uh, even more complimentary than having someone laugh at it is to have them build on top of it. Um, just you know, how the pitches work their way through to, to being an actual sketch that lands on air, uh, just all of those things. Like, what was your research? Um, well, I have to say that for you to say that it's convincing is like the highest praise. <laughs> like, so I, in the summer, I did an event where um, there were a bunch of, people who worked at NBC, including some staffers who a few years before had been pages, worked at different shows, and some of them had worked at SNL, and they said, um, they said it's scarily accurate, and I was like, those are the sweetest words in the English <laughs> language, because I really do, I mean, I do a lot of research. In this case, it was such a joy, like the research itself was, was a pandemic escape. So um, I live in Minnesota, I live in Minneapolis, and I'm, I'm Thanks. <laughs> I feel like I'm like a rock star at a you know. Like, um, so, and I'm I'm 48 years old, and I've I've like never. So I I ultimately I've I've never written for TV. I've barely been inside a, t a TV studio. Like I have a couple times, but um, very probably when like 90% of the book existed, I attended a dress rehearsal for SNL. Um, I couldn't get, like, that, that was like, you know, I, cu I couldn't even get a ticket to the live show. Like, it was actually a major triumph that I got this dress rehearsal ticket. Um, so it, it really is all, like, reading. So it's, you know, there's so many um, cast member memoirs, autobiographies. I think the most well-known is probably Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, which, which is wonderful. Um, there's also, there's, like, Tracy Morgan's, there's Rachel Dratch's, there's Colin Jost, which is pretty recent, a very punchable face. And there's also probably the single most useful one was um, a cast member named Jay Moore, M-O-H-R. I love Jay Moore. Oh my God, have you read Gasping for Airtime? No, I have to, but I just loved his very short-lived show, Action. Oh, I, I haven't. Way so, back when. so his book, he was on SNL in the early 90s for two years, 
And it's, the, it's not like aggressively bridge burning, but it's more bridge burning than any other memoir. And it doesn't make you go through his childhood. It like starts at SNL and it ends at SNL. So it that was very useful. Um, there's also, I'm sure some of you have read, there's like a 745 page oral history of SNL from 1975. It's, it's like a joy. Like it's like if, you, if you're looking for like a holiday read where you can like dip in and dip out and, but it's the whole thing is riveting. Um, there's a documentary made by James Franco that's like a week in the life of, of the show. I think it's maybe 10-ish years old. There's also, there's um, an SNL YouTube channel that takes you like behind the scenes, which, and I would definitely be like, like I'd be, you know, there, or even sometimes there would be it could be like Tina Fey's, um, you know, like if she's back to host and she's she's doing some promotional thing and they do like a 360 degree, you know, around the studio and I'd be like, in, like looking at my computer like this, and like this or like I like I'm doing like a map of what I think it looks like because it was it was actually hard to find a map of the studio, which there's some point where it doesn't matter actually what the, it just has to be convincing. It doesn't have to be because it's fiction. But, um, but then also we live in the golden age of comedy podcasts, including, but not limited to, there's, there's one fly on the wall, which, which came into existence while I was working on this book. Um, that's Dana Carvey and David Spade interviewing other people from SNL about mm -hmm. SNL. So it's just, it's such a cultural institution that there's a ton out there. Did you meet Lorne Michaels? Oh, no. I didn't, I had, whatever the, the, like, backstage access is, I have the opposite. And in fact... <laughs> Some of you might know, I, I have written two books about, you know, former f first ladies. Like, I think the fact that I am, I mean, I'm not, I would not pretend that I'm like a literary outsider, but I think I'm not someone, like, I'm not afraid that Lauren Michaels won't green light my idea for a sitcom, because I don't have an idea for a sitcom, or like, I'm not afraid to write about stuff in DC, like I'm not afraid I won't be invited to a party in DC because I won't be invited to a party in DC anyway. I mean, there was a time I lived there and like taught high school students. Um, so yeah, no, no, I never, I, I, and we can also jump ahead. Also, I've never met Laura Bush. This might be my, my no, I, my, I, I would be happy to, but I, th I think this weekend might be the closest I get. Um, so, you had a whole um, other project to write within the novel, and that is the sketches. And they all read like feasible sketches. Like, I could see these on SNL. Um, Thank you. Uh, I... <laughs> well, okay, I, I already know, but I don't think I can, wait. Just, just that Benji pitched starting there. Oh, okay. Benji pitched a sketch about the former FBI director, James Comey, writing the memoir he'd just published, dictating Dear Diary-style girlish reminiscences. <laughs> then a writer named Liana pitched a sketch where Noah Brewster would play the token hot straight boy in a high school chorus. Then a writer named Tony pitched a sketch where Noah Brewster would play a preppy white guy running for office and guest preaching in a black church. Henrietta, who was one of the two cast members I worked with the most, said she and Viv, who was the other cast member I worked with the most, wanted to do a sketch about internet searches made by dogs. And the internet searches made by dogs is literally laugh out loud funny. Um, and I'd love to hear uh, just how you came up with these sketches, um, and a lot of just the, the humor, that, the banter that goes on between the writers. Um, well, so this might destroy the book for you, but okay, the, the first thing I'll say is, I go, go, well, I'll, I'll jump ahead. My, my children helped me write the dog Google searches, and we, we did it in, we were, I picked them up at school one day, and we got trapped in the school parking lot because there were so many other <laughs> parents doing pickup, and so I was like, I give up, like I was trying to back up, and I was like, I give up and pull, I mean, we, I'd been talking, and I knew I wanted to do this. Oh, and we got a pandemic dog that we're all obsessed with, and we had never had a dog before as a family. Um, and so I think I had, I had maybe had this particular, because a lot of the ideas are referred to, but there's not actual dialogue, and that's one of the few, that the, the lines that would be in it, um, are in there. And so my kids um, 
you know, like brainstormed. And actually, I this is like very name droppy, but festive. I did an event with um, Judy Bloom where she was talking about how much she loves one of the lines in there. And I had to say, like, my 14 year old wrote that like three years ago. Like, I like thank thank you for the compliment, but I can't take any credit. Um, but the the um, I I think that like often going through life, I, I find my my own life or myself to be sort of ridiculous or undignified or I'll have some moment where I'll be like this feels like an SNL sketch which I think probably a lot of us have that moment where we say to ourselves and so I was like all I have to do like if you write for SNL you know you have to come up with something like overnight on Tuesday night but if you're writing a novel like I was like all I have to do is every time I think to myself this situation is like an SNL sketch just make note of it and then I just need like 10 of those for my entire novel so like I just I need a few months it was so that's how I did it. Um, so, uh, I'd love for you to talk about the structure of the novel. Um, it is, the novel is made up of a prologue, three chapters, and an epilogue. Uh, the first chapter takes place in 2000, I hope I'm not, well, I'm spoiling it. The first chapter takes place in 2018 over the course of seven days, which is the amount of time it takes to put together an episode, um, or an, uh, an SNL or Night Owl's show. Like it, it does take seven days. That's how they do it. Even Actually, even few, because it's, like, yeah. it's Monday to Saturday. Yeah. yeah, Monday to Saturday night. Um, the second chapter takes place uh, in 2020, also over the course of seven days. Um, and then the third breaks away from the time limit, a lone wolf, if you will, uh, as it creates its own way. And I'm curious, when did you know the structure you wanted to use, and how did you come to it? Um, well, this is, this is one of those sort of um, conversations or questions that's, like, so interesting to me. Like, I'm obsessed with structure and find it fascinating. And I feel like usually the success or failure of any piece of writing, whether it's, like... Uh, wedding toast or a condolence letter or a novel it's all structure and like the order of information and you know what you withhold and what you put at the end and what you put um so but weirdly I think that I aspire not for the structure to be invisible and in this case I think the structure does draw attention to itself especially because of the email section mm -hmm. in the middle but for the reader, my goal in some ways is for the reader not to consider structure and just to be like pulled forward and pulled along. Um, I, I don't know, I think that I did always conceive of it as having an email section in the middle. And I mentioned this to my editor and my agent and they were, both of whom I've worked with for a while, I have great like fondness and respect for them. Um, and I think they were like, we look forward to seeing that, Curtis. Um, and then they both liked it. But, but I, I mean, in some ways, because I do think that there are people like, why would anyone write really long emails? Why would anyone want to read fake or other people's really long emails? Whereas I'm kind of like, if you said to me, I have this folder of emails that basically show two people falling in love like I would not be able to tear through it fast enough I'd be so excited and if you were like you know them you don't know them I'd be like I'm very flexible either way <laughs> so I, to me it's like of course of course that would be interesting um well in that first chapter you know there's the pressure cooker of literally like we've got to put on a show um and you're in the trenches and there's a time squeeze on it uh, and then there's also that, not necessarily a pressure, but I think when, when you communicate via email, you have a filter of like anonymity, um, and you can be a lot more revealing. It's like you're talking in the dark. Um, and uh, I thought what was also interesting was that the, the first chapter is prose and texts, and then the second one is all email uh, that get longer and longer. Um, and I just wondered at your thought to have it be seven days for the second one as well, and what you felt like that was accomplishing, and then to, to broaden that in the last chapter. Um, well, I do, I think that, that in the first chapter, there's, you know, Sally thinks, she thinks or hopes that she and Noah are flirting or are attracted to each other, but she's so full of doubt that she thinks, how can a celebrity 
be romantically interested in me. You know, and somebody who who could and has dated very attractive women, whereas, and she talks about herself as sort of average. So she, it's not that she like hates herself. She just doesn't see herself as being someone that, that a celebrity would date. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of like, there's there's all these unknowns. And then I think that the emails, in some way they like, deepen the possibility that there is something romantic, but they also deepen the unknowns, that there's there's not, and there's there's certain lines that she kind of like reads over and over. And I, I mean, I certainly, like I feel like um, with friends over the years, I've been like, can you analyze this text? Or like, you know, and, and even still like my, you know, divorced friends who are dating, like, it'll be like, like, you know, there's my friend who, like, meant to send the screenshot of the woman she was dating to me and sent it to the woman she was dating <laughs> and me, and, um, but not even in a group text. That would have been awkward, but um, anyway, so it's like, I do, I think that that impulse kind of never, that, like, analyzing, and, and I, so I do, um, I mean, there has to be enough suspense or tension to, to make the reader keep reading and, and to not be like, okay, they're definitely in love. It's much more enticing if it's like, they might be in love or they're, they could be in love. Um, well, and on the note of phones and sharing this information, uh, phones, social media, our addiction to reaching for our phone first thing in the morning, um, knowing that social media isn't real, but we still believe it. Uh, that all plays really heavily in here. And uh, I mean, I think with social media, and celebrities feel a lot more accessible than ever, um, but the public opinion on them and their romantic relationships, friendships, see Taylor Swift and Brittany Mahomes, uh, and physical... physical. Can, you, can you expand on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it's become like its own thing now. I mean, like, you know, obviously, you know, Taylor Swift has her romance with... Travis Kelsey, obviously. but it's like, obviously, and then, but now her friendship with Brittany Mahomes is like its own Instagram thing with people dissecting Brittany Mahomes and her hair and fashion choices and foundation, and you're just like, this is like the craziest thing, and I feel like we've all had celebrity crushes, but this really makes it seem like the idea of being in an actual relationship with someone famous is hell. You're just shredded. So I will say, especially with Taylor and Travis, as I as I think of them, um, I mean the fact it's like it's like a pop star, Kansas City. Or like I'm like I'm like, should I write this as a novel or did I already? Yes. Like, um, so I, well, I think I, I think that that something that makes celebrities and social media kind of fascinating is that we know that some is real and some is fake, but we don't know which is which. And there's something that's really like kind of teases your brain about that because there do, like sometimes celebrities will post stuff and you think either that's so like misspelled and poorly punctuated, you must have written it. I mean, no offense to, they're very, there are a lot of very intelligent celebrities, but like, but or, but or like it'll be like such clearly bad judgment or something that, that you're also like, you, that you must have done that yourself. But then um, it also can seem, which I, I think, I think that sometimes celebrities, it, feel like, it feels like are this um, like exaggerated version of the rest of us. And so maybe sometimes with people we know, we wonder, was that a fake interaction? Was that a real interaction? Is my friend who posts those like blissful looking, you know, pictures of her vacations, but I think she's actually really unhappy, like what's going on with that? So I do, I think that it's just magnified versions of maybe everyday phenomena. Um, yes, and, but it was also, you know, it's, I'm not, not going to spoil it, but the, the third chapter is, um, it was just sort of heartbreaking, and you just realize, like, everything that you lose when you're a celebrity, like, any sort of, like, anonymity, any privacy, any ability to, like, live a real life. Well, I, it is um, interesting, too, because I, I think that, like, I think there can be, um, you know, pe we, or, like, not famous people can kind of almost, like, 
play out. Like, like in some, I, years ago, I interviewed a professor who basically said, if, if two non-famous people are talking about a celebrity, a lot of what we're doing is like agreeing upon what we think are like appropriate behavioral norms, and we're sort of using that person as a... Um, and so I, which I think is, you know, I, I guess that's like unremarkable or unsurprising. But then I think that the, the kind of maybe more unpleasant version of that is... I think sometimes we can almost feel like a celebrity doesn't exist unless we're viewing them. And so like they don't they don't brush their teeth if we're not you know like if we're not there to witness it or if it's not posted. And I think I mean I think some of us can feel like if we don't take a picture of it it, it like of course once I put on Jonathan Lethem's jacket and we stood so I was like we we have to take seven pictures or um so so it's like again there's there's that inside me too but um but I do think that that, yeah, like, celebrities are people, too. And I assume, you know, in, in the context of, like, your job, you've encountered, like, often, um, like, I think there can be, sometimes there's an a, there's a impulse to, like, tear celebrities down, but I have not met a ton, but I've met, you know, s- several, and I feel like they tend to be very charismatic. Like, there, it's not by chance that they ended up super, super famous and beloved and... They, yeah. Do you agree with that in terms of? Yes. Uh, I also know, like, I mean, I'm obsessed with, like, Tom Holland and Zendaya. And with Blue Eyes. Why? Eye. Why are you obsessed with them? I don't know. I just, I, I like that they are both, like, great dancers, that they've been doing this forever, that they've found each other, that they seem like a haven for each other. And, you know, and but also being in this industry, it's like, I don't want, at the same time, I don't want to meet celebrities. Like, I like having them be distant from me. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> um... By the way, I will say, one, um, when I was doing an event, actually in Kansas City, on book tour, um, someone said to me, what's the celebrity couple whose breakup would most upset you? And I, I was like, oh, this book is so fun to talk about. Like, when I, when I, I will say, I mean, again, I, I stand by and feel proud of my novel, um, Rodham, which was immediately preceding this. Um, when that came out, people would say, when, if ever, will we elect a female president? And then when Romantic Comedy was published, people would say, like, if Pete Davidson wanted to date you, like... <laughs> well? I mean, under the right circumstances, like, I, I, it's, it turns out, Pete Davidson turns out to be sort of divisive, where I think a lot of people are, are like, um, you know, I, I cannot see it, or they're like, oh, like, you know, in a second, and, and I kind of feel somewhere in between, like, I think he's endearing, and certainly very talented, he's a little young for he's me. He's a little young, I'd go on at least one date, we're going to see what happens. Um, okay, I want to make sure that we have, um, I do have some more questions, but I want to make sure that you all have time for them too, um, so I think we're going, I think we have speakers on the or microphones on the side for people to walk up to? Yeah. Um, and while people get in line and prepare their questions, um, I will ask you, uh, it's, you perfectly capture the sort of like punishing rush of being in the trenches at an insanely demanding job. Um, uh, your agent, Tracy Fisher, and I were both in that position at William Morris in the mailroom, and we thrived on it, like loved it, um, it was such a grind, it becomes your whole world, it has to be, because that's where you spend all of your time. Uh, and you, but you also take a pride, a uh, sense of pride in it. Like, I can cut this, and other people can't, and you sort of don't realize until after you've left that like, oh no, they can, they just don't want to. Like, <laughs> no one wants your job, babe. Um, some, some people want that job. No. <laughs> some people want that job. But have you had that job before? Um, I mean, I, so when I, I, I was a um, reporter, like, I mean, any, anyone who's a real journalist would not think I had been a real journalist, but I did work, I worked at like a business magazine, and then I went to grad school, and then I think there were, I think maybe there were three and a half years between when I um, finished grad school and when my first novel, Prep, was published, and I was like freelancing for like teen people, which no longer exists, but it was the, the junior people, um, and other, and I, I definitely, and I was also teaching part-time, and I, I worked a ton, like I, one of the ways that I, 
I, I felt like, like I, I, you know, there was the sort of Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson, Super Bowl performance, which like I didn't see because I was on deadline. You know, like there were like things that I kind of was like, um, so it's not, I mean, it was very much a choice. It wasn't like some, you know, like, but, but I do feel like I was just always on deadline. Or like if someone said, you know, this is a wonderful book, I'd be like, maybe I could read it. And I'm like a writer. Like, I would be like, maybe I can read it in six months or something because I'm so, like, um, but I don't know. I mean, and then I had kids and I look back and think, eh, like, was it, I felt like I was so busy, but was I really so busy? So, so I don't, I mean, I don't, I think that there have been times in my life when I have romanticized hard work. And I was, I think I was a little bit cured of that by the pandemic. But, but I, I also will say being, I mean, being a writer is such such a privilege like I'm I consider my and you know th thank you all for like l allowing me to be um that there are also times when I am reading a book because like I'm on a panel with someone and I'll think like is this is this work or is this pleasure and then I'll think like what could be a greater sign of how lucky I am than, than that I can't distinguish if I'm <laughs> doing something for because I have to or because I want to because it's like that is very clear for many people in their jobs <laughs>